All right, my name's George. I'm the pastor here at The Gathering. Great to see you if we haven't had a chance to meet yet. We've been doing uh, this, this really cool series called Reimagine, and it's about taking a look at life through a biblical worldview and challenging some of the, the basic uh, ideas, maybe preconceptions we have about uh, what life is all about and how we're supposed to navigate our way through it. And a worldview, as we, if you've been following along, it's just a, a set of core beliefs that help you navigate life. And uh, we keep using this example, I keep using this example of the, the two paths where uh, one is a biblical worldview, one's a secular worldview. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus tells us that the biblical worldview is a narrow one. Very few people actually choose it, but it leads to life. The secular worldview, that's chosen by the majority of people, and uh, that one leads to destruction. My heart for you as your pastor is to present a biblical worldview so that you can be in a biblical lane your whole life and make sure that you end up at not just a great life here on earth, but eternal life with Jesus uh, forever. Uh, the, the core beliefs that we've been looking at a worldview is made up of, of um, what you believe is real, what you then believe is true based on your reality. From that, you decide what's good uh, for you. That gives you your desires, and from your desires, you make your choices. Pretty simple. Let me show you how it works. In a secular worldview, what's real is that everything evolved. It's survival of the fittest, natural selection. What's true, then, is that we are the highest life form, i.e., the most important people on the planet. I think most people would agree with that, that they're the most important thing. Uh, what's good, then, is to survive and thrive, and we're all working our way towards that. What's desired is the right to choose what's in our self-interest. We don't want to be told uh, to do something or adopt something that isn't in our self-interest. We want to have that self-determination. What's chosen then are things that improve the quality of my life. Now, how that contrasts with a biblical worldview is that from a biblical worldview, we believe that God created humans in His image. Therefore, what's true is that He is the source of life, i.e., the most important thing. And what's good then is to be in a genuine relationship with Him, because if you don't have a relationship with Him, you're cut off from all life, uh, both life, abundant life here and eternal life uh, forever. And so what's desired is the right to become children of God, our God-given destiny. And then what we choose are what demonstrates the reality of that relationship with God in my life. Make sense? All right. So I want to uh, look at the danger as we talk about worldview in being deceived by empty philosophy, and worldly ideas. In Colossians 2.8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. This is basically the challenge to us in this series is not to just accept the world's view but to challenge it and say, what does Christ actually say through his word? And then how does that direct my life? Now, we've been talking about all kinds of things from friendships to, to marriage to dating to parenting to all kinds of topics. And for the last uh, little, I think, four or five weeks of this series, I'm going to try to tackle the most thorny subjects in society today and look at them from a biblical worldview. So today we're going to talk about abortion. All right, so I was a little, I've been doing a lot of research and I want to uh, approach this with just grace and sensitivity. My goal here is not to beat anybody over the head uh, with a Bible, uh, not to guilt anybody, not to condemn anybody, but simply to present two worldviews, a secular worldview about abortion 
and then a biblical worldview about abortion and let you make your choice about where you want to align with your life. Now, this verse uh, is, is particularly uh, true when it comes to the issue of abortion. It has been framed uh, in a lot of different ways. It's been this, this issue of abortion has been framed as a woman's choice. It's been framed as a right to privacy. That was the Casey decision. It's been framed as reproductive health care. Uh, it's been framed as gender equality. It's been framed as bodily autonomy. Uh, it's been framed as personal freedom. There are so many different ways that this issue has been framed that it, it is honestly difficult for most people to try to navigate and know what's really the issue at stake here. I want to I show you an example of a, 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 a new, a recent ad. I don't know if you've seen this ad, a California ad about abortion. This is in different states. This is being uh, displayed in different states across the nation. Need an abortion? California is ready to help. Now, I want you to notice something at the bottom of this ad. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. And that's paid for by your governor. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just letting you know the facts. But I want you to notice that this message that's being presented here is that offering abortion is loving obedience to God. That's the message. That if you do not offer abortions, you are being disobedient and unloving. Is that true? Is it truly loving to freely offer abortion? That's a fair question. Is it unloving to reject a woman's right to choose an abortion? This is, these are the things that are going to get thrown at you in our society, and this is where a, having a clear worldview uh, can be helpful. So the reality, though, is that abortion is about something much more fundamental and foundational than any of the issues in which it's being framed currently. Abortion is ultimately about human rights. And what I mean here is the, the core question that we need to answer is what qualifies someone as a full-fledged human being? This is the core fundamental issue of abortion, who actually qualifies as a full-fledged human being and therefore deserves human rights? When do you believe a fetus becomes a person? This is the, the first question we have to ask before we can ask if abortion is, is justified in any circumstance. You first have to answer the question, whom are you aborting? Is it a, just a, a mass of cells, or is it a full-fledged human being? Do you see how that's more foundational than your right to privacy? It's more foundational than your right to health care. We need to first discover and determine for ourselves from our biblical worldview what, it, what qualifies someone to be a full-fledged human being. So today I'm going to look at, at three things. I want to look at first the predominant secular view on abortion. Now I know there are a lot of uh, varying views on abortion. I tried to pick the middle of the road when it comes to a secular worldview. Uh, I'm not trying to get fringy on one side or the other. Just pick the majority and I'll show you some statistics about that. Then we're going to look at a biblical view of abortion. And then lastly, I want to take a look at a scientific view of abortion. Uh, we're always told to follow the science, so I thought, well, let's be intellectually honest and look at what the science actually says and which view, which worldview it seems to, to best support. Sound good? Yeah? You ready? You're like, why did I come to church today? <laughs> this is more like a college lecture. Um, so let's, let's look first at some stats. I want to 
uh, look at some quick stats on abortion in America. 86% of U.S. women will have a child by, the age, for, by age 45. So that's the vast majority of women are going to have a child by the, age, by age, by the end of their, their childbearing years. Uh, so childbirth is a, a massive issue for the vast majority of women. 23% of women in the U.S. will have an abortion by that same age. So almost a quarter of women will have an abortion by age 45. 92% of abortions occur between weeks 12 and 13. This will be important as we look at the science later on to understand when abortions actually happening. This I thought was interesting. Religious affiliation has little impact on your abortion choices. Take a look at this. 38% of people getting abortions in America report no religious affiliation, little over a third. 30% identify as Protestants. That's both evangelical and mainline Protestants. 24% identify as Catholic. And then 8% report some other affiliation. What is interesting is this basically represents the religious demographic of our country. That's about how many people hold to each of those, uh, those religious affiliations. What to me is really sad is right here, right, that that's 54% of people getting abortions identify as Christian. So a, being a Christian doesn't seem to have an impact when it comes to the choice of abortion. Now, to put abortion in perspective, I want to look at some of the leading causes of death in America. So the CDC rep, uh, rates heart disease as the highest uh, as the le highest leading cause of death, 690,000 uh, people die of heart disease every, in 2020, died of heart disease. 598, almost 600,000 people died of cancer. 345,000 died of COVID. 192,000 died of accidental deaths. 159, almost 160,000 of stroke. 151,000 respiratory disease, 133 Alzheimer's, 101 died of diabetes, and here's the kicker, 930,000 died of abortion. So just to put it in perspective of how much, abor how prevalent abortion is in our society. Again, I'm not making any value judgments right now, I'm just putting the facts out there for you. So let's talk about this core question. When does human life begin? Before we can discuss whether or not abortion is morally right or wrong, we must first decide when human life begins. So let's start with the secular view. So remember we talked about the, the core beliefs of a worldview. The first one was what is real? So when it comes to life, what is real from a secular worldview? Well, human life came to be through evolution, this survival, this process of, random, of natural selection through uh, random chance in billions of years resulted in uh, human beings coming to exist as we now know them. That's uh, the reality for someone with a secular worldview. When it comes to life, then, what is true? Well, human life then begins at a certain point in fetal development. Evolution is all about development. It's about progressing from simple to complex. And so this worldview fits very well with someone who believes in evolution, that life would happen at some point in fetal development. Thus, embryos are not human beings until they have reached a certain level of development. This is the secular worldview. It's just a mass of cells with human potential until it reaches a, a certain determined uh, stage. Now, the majority view with a secular worldview is what they call the viability standard, and that's 
when a, uh, a fetus could live on its own outside of the womb, uh, this all the way back with, with Roe versus Wade, uh, reaffirmed with Casey, the Supreme Court settled on 24 weeks as what is viability. Uh, when a, a, uh, a child, a fetus could survive outside of the womb. And this view justifies first and second term abortions. Make sense? That if it's not life until it's viable outside the womb, then that justifies killing it because it's not a human being until, past, until you're into your third trimester. The, one of the challenges with this worldview is that technology is rapidly changing. And if you work in a NICU, any NICU nurses out there, right? We got some, I know we got some nurses and doctors out there. But that number is dropping as technology is increasing. I think right now, I think the earliest was uh, 12 weeks or 16 weeks. They were able to take a, a, a baby and bring it to full term. It also is challenging because it depends on where you are. The viability of a fetus in New York is very different from the viability of a fetus, say, in Bangladesh or East Africa, where it may be more like 35 weeks, 36 weeks, because the technology is not there. So uh, finding a clean answer to that is a difficult one. The minority view uh, is a first, first breath standard, and this is uh, that a child is alive when it is fully and completely developed and takes its first breath. This justifies partial birth and late-term abortions. If you hold to this view, you're okay with killing a child all the way up to partial birth because it hasn't taken its first breath yet. The challenge is what about the brain activity that's already measurable in a 20-week fetus? What about the heart that's beating from week five? What about sensory perception that starts early on? Does one organ failure make you non-human? And that's the ethical challenge with that stance, is that just because your lungs are not yet working, you are less human than someone whose lungs are working. And the extreme view here, and you're going to see this more and more. I keep hearing this mentioned in the news, interestingly, by senators, and that's the personhood standard. And this is an extreme view. It's not held by many people, but it's getting more and more press time, so I wanted to throw it out there so that you would be familiar with it. And this is the idea that you are not fully a human being until you possess self-awareness. And that usually uh, is, is known to, to be about 28 weeks post-birth. And so this would justify even early infant infanticide, the, the killing of children. And this is where uh, the extreme side of, of this argument is going. Okay? The challenge of that is, what about people in comas? Can we kill them? Are they now less human because they lack self-awareness? What about traumatic brain injury? What about our brave men and women who get injured in combat? Should we discard them because they lack uh, self-awareness due to a traumatic brain injury fighting for our country? See the, the ethical challenges that are there uh, beyond killing children, um, which is pretty bad. Now, when it comes to what is good? I think, I, I've done a lot of reading, um, listened to a lot of, of uh, prominent speakers on the, the pro-choice side of the aisle, the pro-abortion side of the aisle, the secular worldview. And from what I can tell, there, when it comes to what is good, they want to respect and protect all human life. In fact, they're pretty passionate about it. Sometimes more passionate than what would be considered the, the pro-choice or biblical side. They're very passionate about respecting and protecting all human life. So when it comes to life, then what's desired? So uh, if we had it all up on one chart, which I'll show you later, you follow it down. We all evolved. Uh, what's true is that, that 
Uh, life is, is, begins at a, a predetermined stage of development. What's good is to protect the life of every human being. When it comes to life, then what is desired? And here's uh, the core of it. When it comes to life, what is desired is to protect the women's interest over the fetuses because the fetus is not yet fully human. And so this is the logical progression that you have to make if you hold to a secular worldview that you want to protect a woman's rights. There's, there's very little thought for a fetus's rights because in this worldview, it's not human yet. Therefore, it does not deserve the same level of value and protection. And then what, when it comes to life, what's chosen, that's to seek an abortion if it's in the women's interest. And it's interesting, even talking with evangelical Christians who say they, they believe in the Bible, this is where a lot of people are starting to land who are Christians. That if it's in the woman's self-interest, she should be allowed and encouraged to choose that. But I want you to understand that belief comes from a secular worldview. Make sense? You guys doing okay? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'm not preaching yet. We'll get there. <laughs> Let's talk about the biblical worldview. Now I'm going to start preaching. All right? What's the biblical view of when life begins? All right? So when it comes to life, what's real? Genesis 1.28, we believe that God created humans in his own image. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When it comes to life, then, what's true? If God created us in his image, what do we believe is true? We believe that God gives all humans life at conception. This is what the Bible teaches. Let me show you what that means. And, and, to, and to realize, the, to take a biblical worldview, you are then saying all embryos are living human beings. This is what you have to accept if you believe that God created all human life and that he gives all humans life at conception. Let me break this down a little bit. The Bible tells us that God is the one who makes us and gives us life. Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So life is not something that happens through a natural process. It is God-given. It's something that God gives. The almighty creator of the universe gives you your life. And then the question for us then is going to be when? When does God give you your life? This is going to be the key for us. So Bible treats, this is interesting, the Bible treats conception and birth as one thing. I'm going to give you just a few examples. There's literally dozens of them. Genesis 4.1, Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived and bore Cain. Genesis 21, 2, Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son. Ruth 4, 13, so Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Talking about Mary, Luke, in Luke 1, 31, Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He will be great and called the son of the Most High God. The Bible, interestingly, does not, does not treat conception as a separate thing from birth. That's something that a secular worldview does. A biblical worldview treats it as one process. Conception through birth is, is perceived and treated in the Bible as one thing. The Bible also teaches us that God is the one who forms us in our mother's womb. Psalm 39, 13 through 16, familiar verse. You made all my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. This is David talking about God. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. 
The Bible talks about life. It talks about God weaving you together, delicately, masterfully creating you in your mother's womb. It's not a random chance. God builds everything into you knowing every moment that you will ever live for your entire life. God has a plan for us even before conception. Jeremiah 1.5, another famous passage. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. To give you an example of life in the womb, there's this great example of Jesus and John the Baptist interacting in the womb. Uh, Luke 1, verses 39 through 44. That time Mary got ready. Uh, she's just been announced that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She goes to visit her uh, cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist. She gets ready, hurries to a town, the hill country of Judea, when she at, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Look at this. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and elizabeth was filled with the holy spirit in a loud voice she proclaimed blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear but why am i so favored that the mother of my lord should come to me as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears the baby in my womb leapt for joy i want you to look at this elizabeth is saying in the womb jesus is lord he did not become Lord at birth. He was Lord before conception. He was Lord at conception. He was Lord at birth. He was Lord during his entire life. He was Lord at the crucifixion. He was Lord at the resurrection. He's going to be Lord for all eternity. Jesus was not a mass of cells. He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all humanity. And John, in the womb, recognized that and leapt for joy at Mary's voice. Not just heard her voice, had an emotional reaction in the womb to the nearness of his Lord and Savior. It's powerful stuff. Now, the Bible also... That's not enough for you. The Bible also gives legal protection for life in the womb. Look at Exodus 21, verses 22 through 24. It's giving a, a hypothetical. If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so imagine that Scott and I are duking it out, and Dina's pregnant, and we bang into her, and she gives birth prematurely. This is the scenario that would cover that legally? What's the legal precedent, according to God, for when a woman would give birth prematurely? Notice, yet no harm follows. What does that mean? Baby survives, right? So there's a fight. The woman tries to get in the mix and save Scott. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> and uh, give, as a result, uh, goes into early labor, gives birth to her child, and the child survives. There's no damage done, even though there's no damage done. Look, he shall surely be punished as the woman husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So he's fined for causing premature birth. Now, what if there's harm? But if any harm follows... You shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, and so on. And this is this law of reciprocity, that here there is real punishment for causing harm to a, a fetus in the womb. So, because of that, when it comes to life, because God gives life at conception, when it comes to life, what is good? See, I believe we hold the same view. The Bible holds the, those with a biblical worldview have the same idea of good as those who hold a secular worldview, and that's where we get confused. Because we also want to protect 
life, respect and protect life, just like those who hold to a secular worldview. They're not out there trying to hurt kids, and well, most of them aren't, uh, trying to, and most Christians aren't either. There are some Christians, I'll go, we're, we're just as culpable. A uh, worldview doesn't keep you from doing bad, a good worldview doesn't keep you from doing bad things. Uh, hopefully it informs you and helps you make better choices, but I believe we all want, want to respect and protect the life of every human being. When it comes to life, though, what's desired from a biblical perspective is to protect the women, woman and the fetus's interest. From a biblical worldview, you have to want to protect both of them. And because they are equally human and valuable. And when it comes to life, then, what's chosen? To seek solutions that protect both the woman and the fetus. And this is a biblical worldview of abortion. Now, let's take a look at, at how they line up together. And some of those solutions can be education, uh, ad adoption, compassionate care, uh, etc. So let's take a look at how these line up. So we've got our beliefs. We've got a secular uh, a biblical worldview. When it comes to what's real, secular worldview is that human life came to be through evolution. Therefore, human value is subjective. The biblical worldview is that God created all humans in his image. Therefore, all humans have intrinsic value. Uh, what's true from a secular point of view is that life begins at a certain stage of development. So not all, hu not all embryos are human beings. From a biblical perspective, God gives all humans life at conception, and all embryos are living human beings. What's good is to respect and protect the life of every human being. We agree on that. What's desired is to protect the women's interests over the fetuses because it's not human yet. What's desired from a biblical worldview is to protect both the woman and the fetuses' interests because they're equally human. What's chosen is to seek an abortion if it protects the women's interests from a secular standpoint. Biblical seek solutions to protect both the women and the fetus. Now, let's look at a scientific view. So we've looked at the secular view of abortion. We've looked at the biblical view of abortion. Let's look at the scientific view of abortion. This is a, an amicus brief. Amicus brief simply means a, a brief from friends of the court. Amicus just means like amicable people that are friendly to the court. Uh, this is an amicus brief of biologists that was submitted for the recent Dobbs versus Jackson healthcare case where Roe versus Wade was overturned. This was not in support of either side. So this was presented as a non-party non support brief of biologists from over 15 country, different universities from 15 different countries around the world. This is what they said to help the court as they wrestled through this issue. A review of recent discoveries and the development of scientific literature since Roe reveals a strong consensus that agrees fertilization, a process which starts with the sperm egg binding and is completed with sperm egg pro-nuclear fusion is the starting point of the self-directed development and life cycle of the human organism and thus the life of a human. That's the science. That's their consensus that life begins at conception. But let's not just take their word for it. Let's take a look at this whole process. I'm going to walk you through the first 13 weeks because this is when mo the vast majority of abortions occur by week 13. So this is day one. This is when an egg is fertilized by a sperm. It is at this point, so both the sperm and the ovum disintegrate completely as it gives way to an entirely new, unique organism. I don't know if you know that. If you ever hear, hear the term fertilized egg, that's what you buy from, Grand, from Grangettos when you want to hatch chicks. It does not happen in human beings. As soon as a sperm and an egg unite, 
the egg and the sperm dissolve, fuse into an entirely new entity, a genetically unique entity that doesn't carry any of the same qualities of the sperm or the egg. I don't know if you know that an ovum is designed to attract sperm the second it is, uh, it is penetrated by a sperm, it becomes hostile to all sperms. It changes its molecular structure immediately and begins to form into something completely new and different with a completely unique DNA. This is one of the most interesting uh, recent discoveries that I thought was just fascinating. I wanted to share this with you. Uh, I'm calling it the spark of life, maybe. Who knows? But look at this. Watch this video. This is the first visible sign that an egg is fertilized in a newly... So let me back this up. It's happening fast. We're going we're gonna to see it in slow motion. This is what happens when a sperm unites with an egg. That flash of light, did you see that? They've now caught this through powerful electron microscopes that when a sperm unites with an egg, there is an instant release of zinc off the surface of the ovum that produces this spark of life. At the moment of conception, they've never seen that before. Now, is that definitive proof? No, but it's really cool. <laughs> that as soon as the, the sperm and egg unite, there's this whoosh, this flash of light, and in an instant, the molecular structure changes into something new and unique. Now, by week one, this single cell Zygote grows rapidly through cell division, and it's about 70 to 100 cells within the first week. By week two, it's what's called a blastocyst. Uh, it implants into the uterine wall. It's sev several hundred cells at this stage. By week three, the umbilical cord has formed. Sex has already genetically been determined at this point. Even though you can't see it, it's already genetically been determined what the sex is. By week four, the brain begins to develop. Blood begins to flow through veins separate from its mother's blood. At this point, at just four weeks, this, this embryo has its own blood source and its own heart that's already starting to beat. The heart is beating at 110 beats per minute at this point. By week five, hands and feet start to form. Movement can be detected. The heart is beating at 120 beats per minute. By week six, fingers and toes are developing. Intestines and the digestive system is forming. By week seven, brain waves can be detected. The heart is beating 170 beats a minute. By week eight, fingerprints are formed. Your unique fingerprints are already formed by week eight. Touch receptors begin to develop and cartilage is being replaced with actual bone. By week nine, this is when it's considered now a fetus. We've moved from embryo to fetus. It is having breathing movements. The chest is expanding and contracting as it's starting to develop the muscles necessary to breathe. It can open its mouth and swallow. By week 10, the thyroid is producing hormones. The pancreas is making insulin and the kidneys are producing urine. At week 10. By week 11, all the major organs are formed and functioning except the lungs. By week 12, the fetus can kick, turn over, curl and fan its toes, make a fist, open its mouth, press its lips tightly together, and practice, continue practice breathing. Gender can be seen at this stage sometimes. 
biological reactions to trauma similar to pain occur. If you touch it, it pulls away. 92% of elective abortions are performed at this stage. Another thing to consider is brain development. This is the development of a brain from, you can see the different stages, day 29 all the way through to an adult. Human brain starts developing soon after conception and continues early through early adulthood. By the third week, remember, the brain starts to form. By week 12, the fetus has 3 billion brain cells. And they're growing at a rate of 15 million brain cells an hour. By week 20, it has 13 billion brain cells. At birth, it has as many brain cells as it will ever have. 100 billion brain cells. By its first birthday, your baby's brain has reached a quarter or has reached, a half, has reached 50% of its adult size. It's a quarter of its adult size at birth. So it's only 25% of its brain volume when it's born. 50% by age one, 90% by age six. But the brain is not fully developed until the age of around 25 for the average adult. And why do I bring all this up? Because I want to show you that this idea that in the womb, a process begins at conception that continues to develop well past birth. There's not an arbitrary moment in time in the womb when something dramatic changes that signals a movement from, from non-living human to living human. The Bible teaches that life begins at conception, and that process of development continues well past birth. So, what are our big takeaways? Number one, God created all humans in His image. All humans have intrinsic value and should be protected. Human life begins at conception and develops well past birth. Therefore, all embryos are living human beings and should be protected. The unjust killing of any human being is wrong. I think we would all agree on that. Therefore, from a biblical standpoint, killing an unborn human being is wrong. And for us as the church, we need to seek loving solutions that provide real help in addressing some of the real challenges around unplanned pregnancies. Uh, just to simply tell a woman that she can't have an abortion isn't loving on our part. We've got to step up. We've got to be willing to adopt. You know there's over 2 million couples in America that are waiting to adopt right now, but can't. There's not enough babies out there to adopt. Hopefully this has been... I know it hasn't been like a Bible study, Bible study. I got a little preachy on the Jesus part. Uh, but hopefully this is, has this helped shape your understanding of, of what it means to have a biblical worldview? And I think the, the key for us is to, is to remember what the issue really is about. It's not about whether or not you can choose. It's really not about, cho about your privacy. It's really not about health care. The core fundamental worldview question is when does life begin? And once you settle that, it's going to make your uh, position on abortion relatively easy to articulate and not to get sidetracked. Now, um, I want to I wanna do, you guys good with three more minutes? Can I give three more minutes? I want to address some of the, the trickiest questions around abortion. Uh, that you'll get confronted with. The first one that, that I want to throw out there is this idea that it's my body, my choice. Anybody ever heard that? Uh, that's the most common argument thrown out there, that it's my body, therefore it's my choice. Well, first, we've already demonstrated 
that the embryo, embryo is a distinct living human being separate from its mother. It is in her body, but it is not her body. It has its own separate body, its own distinct, unique DNA, its own organs, its own blood supply. It is not her body. It is in her body. Second, parents already have a moral duty and legal obligation to protect and provide for their children even when it harms their own physical well-being. Now think about this. How many of you have had kids? Can you, is it your choice to neglect your children or kill them because they have kept you up all night for weeks and you are physically exhausted? Them crying again is clearly detrimental to your physical well-being. <laughs> but we have, we recognize as a society that we have a moral and legal obligation to protect and provide for our children, even to our own peril, even to our own harm. And we call it child neglect and child abuse when we don't. And we have laws that prohibit that. It is not my choice to neglect or kill my child because it is hurting my body. What it really comes down to is whether or not you have a living human child that you're responsible for in the womb. That's the question. If it's just, a, it's just like a, a bad tooth and it's hurting you, yeah, there's no moral reason to not pull it. But if it's an actual living human being, then you have a moral, not, not yet a legal, obligation to protect and provide for that child. And third, pregnant women already have, understand that they have a moral responsibility to protect the unborn baby in their womb. For example, I don't know anyone that would argue that a woman has the right to choose to smoke, drink alcohol, take illicit drugs, or prescription medication that she knows will cause severe birth defects to her unborn child and give him, that lifelong, give him or her those lifelong consequences. I don't know anyone that would argue that they have the right to do that to an unborn child. Now, probably the most difficult one is what about rape and incest? What about the cases of rape and incest? Most Christians I've talked to recently will cave on that one. And this is difficult because we have real compassion for the, the suffering of the woman who's been abused and traumatized by that rape or that incestuous relationship that was forced upon her. But we still first have to answer the question whether or not the embryo is a living human being. And if we take a biblical worldview that, yes, it is a living human being, should it be killed just because of the way it came to be? Even if you take a secular worldview, this is a tough one to swallow. To say that if you were conceived in rape, you don't deserve to live. Or that you are somehow less of a human being because of the way you were conceived. A second answer to that is the Bible's clear that children shouldn't be punished for the sins of their fathers. Just because your father may have been a rapist or a, a, a creepy pedophile doesn't mean that you should be punished for his sins. And then third, I'd encourage you to read some of the stories and perspectives of people who were conceived in rape. I have one for you. This is a lady, Rebecca uh, Kiesling. She was conceived at a brutal rape at knife point and adopted at birth. She said, I've often experienced those who would confront me and try to dismiss me with some quick quips like, oh, well, you were lucky. It previously in, in her, her sharing, she had talked about how offended she is when people say that uh, abortion is the reasonable uh, choice uh, for rape because she's she says, you're basically telling me that I didn't deserve to be born. It would have been better if I had never been born. And so she said, I'm, I'm always offended by that. 
But she says, you, they, people tell me, oh, you were lucky. Be sure, she says, my survival has nothing to do with luck. The fact that I'm alive to do has to do with the choices that were made by our society at large, people who fought to ensure abortion was illegal in Michigan at the time, even in cases of rape. People who argued to protect my life and people who voted pro-life, I wasn't lucky, I was protected. And sometimes it, this, these extreme cases get thrown out there without really considering both sides of it. And yes, we feel horrible for the woman who's had to endure that kind of suffering. But the reality is we endure and work through suffering of the sins of people all the time. I know people who have been hit by a drunk driver and, had their, and have lifelong disabilities as a result of that accident. That doesn't justify the intentional killing of another person. We have to work through the sins of other people in our lives all the time. And I think we should give uh, those who were conceived, even in the most horrific circumstances, a chance at life. I'm going to stop there. It's kind of a heavy note, huh? <laughs> it's tough on. Um, but this is, this is the, the power of a worldview and, and thinking through some of these issues. If you've got more questions, I'd love to, to try to answer. Maybe we'll do a Q&A at one point as we get through some of these thorny issues. Uh, we'll do a Q&A Sunday where you can ask any lingering questions you've got about some of these topics, and I'll do my best to provide a biblical worldview. I'm going to have Jared come up and lead us in a closing song, uh, but let's go ahead and stand, and let's pray. <sighs> but Father, these are challenging subjects, and they're laden with a lot of emotion and a lot of strong opinions on both sides. And God, I pray that no one here today has felt judged or condemned or belittled because of what they've thought or believed. I pray that those who are struggling with decisions that they may have made in the past would find your forgiveness and your grace and your healing, even God. Pray for a, a sweet spirit to descend upon this church. In your word, you said that if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And we don't want to be people who are easily held captive by empty philosophies, deceptive arguments that miss the point. We want to be people who are rooted and grounded in the truth of your word. And Father, so I pray uh, just a refreshing upon everyone as we've wrestled through some hard ideas and, and uh, maybe been uncomfortable with what we've been presented with today. Pray that your Holy Spirit would just continue to gently minister truth to us. That we could know that we're walking in ways that are pleasing to you and glorifying you with our choices. So I pray a blessing on everyone here today. Would you bless the fellowship afterwards? Would you bless the meal that we're going to share together? Would you bless our worship now as we sing to you in Jesus' name? Amen.